Good afternoon, Congressional Climate Campers. Welcome to the third installment of EESI's Congressional Climate Camp. I am Dan Brissett, uh, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Oops, screen sharing, there we go. ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Whether briefings or fact sheets, everything we do and produce is freely available and accessible online. As always, the best way to stay up to date and never miss a thing is to visit our website at www.esi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It is a little hard to believe that we are already at Congressional Climate Camp number three. That means March is just about done and April is just about to start. Time moves incredibly fast these days, for sure. I hope everyone is doing well and feeling good about our chances to get back to normal after a few more months of caution and precautions. Please take care and be safe during this time of transition. The date today, March 26th, is also evidence for the urgency of the topic of our session. Congress is hitting its stride. Following the passage of the COVID-19 relief package, all eyes are turning to other priorities, from voting rights to infrastructure to climate change. Our first Congressional Climate Camp was all about process, and specifically how Congress and the administration enact appropriations, budget, and stimulus to advance climate solutions. It was the perfect way to kick off our briefing series. Last month, for Congressional Climate Camp number two, we considered federal policies for high emitting sectors, and specifically these five sectors, uh, agriculture, power generation, buildings, industry, and transportation. Next month, at the end of April, we will study examples of federal policy for mitigation and adaptation win-wins. Each of these four online briefings is structured so we can break out individual presentations to help the busy staff in our audience target their learning. Everything, including slides and written summaries, will be posted online at www.eesi.org. And a condensed audio-only version of each Congressional Climate Camp is available as an episode of our bi-weekly podcast, The Climate Conversation. And the episode for this edition of Climate Camp will be out next Tuesday. Today, we take a step back to remember where have, we, where have we been and recall how we've got to where we are today. This is not an excuse for mindless nostalgia, not at all. But while there is perceptible urgency for climate action today that I think we all feel, we've been on the verge of major climate action before. And even when former initiatives fell short of the finish line, there are many, many lessons to learn from those past experiences. This is not to say that we need to recreate the magic of days gone past. And it is also not to say that we can afford to ignore the good ideas that, can, that have contributed to progress so far. But how can we possibly move ahead without knowing the story of how we got here? What happened? What worked? What didn't work? What were the contours of the debate? What should we do differently this time? That deserves to be part of the debate we're about to start having these days. Sure, we could just host a reading of the Wikipedia entries of the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990 or Waxman Markey, but that is not what ESI does. No, we assemble panels of people who are the best in their fields at sharing their knowledge with policymakers and their staff. And for Congressional Climate Camp number three, we will hear in just a minute from people who were there at the time to share their perspectives of what happened before and why this time is different. And people who can also help frame and focus the debate yet to happen. If we're going to do different, if we're going to do things differently this time, do things better to increase our odds for success, we just have to understand the past. And that's what Congressional Climate Camp number three is all about. Before I turn to our first segment, let me address some logistics. Even though we have a very busy agenda today, you can still send us questions and we'll try to incorporate into those questions into our discussion. If you have a question, uh, there are two ways you can ask it. The first is by sending us a message on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And just to set realistic expectations, with the number of you watching right now, we're not going to be able to get to every question. But ask away. Uh, we'll follow up and do our best to answer every question submitted during Congressional Climate Camp. And now, on to our first panelist. Katie McGinty is the Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer and Government and Regulatory Affairs Officer at Johnson Controls. Along with her current role, she is also the Director of, uh, at FSEP Investments, Inc., and prior to this, she was a senior vice president and environmental defense fund, a candidate for the United States Senate 
a chief of staff to the governor of Pennsylvania, and much, much more. Uh, I'm going to turn this portion of our conversation over to my colleague, Anna McGinn. She's going to be uh, running the segment with Katie today. So, Anna, let me turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Dan and Katie. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation with you, and I think we'll just jump right in. Um, so, we are really in a new era of policymaking on climate change. Um, but at ESI, we also think it's really important to remember how we got here. So we're wondering if you can outline for us what you see as some key turning points in the effort to design and pass climate policy at the federal level and kind of reflect on why this context and information is important for informing our current efforts to design and pass policy. Well, thanks, Anna, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, just first, uh, shout out to EESI. Too long ago to uh, count the years, but when I was a staff person on Capitol Hill, uh, way back in the day and continuing until today, EESI is just such a vital resource, a really efficient and effective way to get information. So it's a pleasure to be back in the EESI family. Look, I think the first question is really important because so much of what was building block over the last couple of decades remains foundational to how we're thinking about and acting on climate change. Although I think it's very exciting to see the kind of maturation of how rich the thinking has become and the action. So to, to toss out two kinds of foundational building blocks. So from the earliest days of environmental policy broadly, it was about understanding those point sources, those particular sources of environmental insult, if you will, of sources of pollution and going after them with particularized regulation. The big change from that came in something called Project 88 in 1988 that said, you know, some elements of challenge to the environment don't operate just in a discrete way, but operate in a regional or global basis. And there we need some new tools. How about if we harness the forces of the market to be aligned with what's needed for environmental protection instead of there being a tension. And it was in that process that the idea of cap and trade was born as the original kind of, or one of the original kinds of market mechanisms. And boy, did it hit the ground running. Um, you know, 1988, just an academic paper, 1990, the centerpiece of the Clean Air Act amendments, uh, and very shortly thereafter, proving its effectiveness in driving, for example, acid rain you know, out, those sulfurous emissions out, and proving to be very effective. Now, fast forward to what those foundational blocks have led to, you can really trace right back some of the key policies that are so effective today market mechanisms became important, not just because of cap and trade, but because it started to talk the language of finance. And so today, when you think about things like Germany having jumped in with, with their feed-in tariffs 15 years or so ago, and then our own production tax credits and investment tax credits, and now, the real greening of capital markets. We at Johnson Controls were a pioneer in being one of the first industrials to float a green bond in the US capital markets. These are brave new tools, but they definitely have their roots in those policies that took root 30 plus years ago. Last piece I would say as we kick off is the the individualized pieces of regulation also remain 
absolutely foundational so that as we try to use market mechanisms and get a macro signal in terms of cutting carbon across big ranges, nations and the globe, we still need mandates, for example, for buildings where Johnson Controls work to be more efficient and equipment to be more efficient. Those are critical companion pieces of the equation cutting edge new, but with re roots back to those innovations 30 plus years ago. Thanks for helping us to kind of draw those lines from back in the 80s <laughs> today. I think that's really helpful um, to kind of see how ideas have evolved over time to design mm -hmm. policies. Um, so you mentioned market mechanisms. One that might come to people's minds uh, is Waxman Markey and that effort to establish a cap and trade um, program for at the federal level. I'm wondering for efforts like Waxman Markey, maybe also the Clean Power Plan that never became law, did they still have an impact on US greenhouse gas emissions reductions? If so, how, how did they have an impact even without becoming law? And, and why is it important for us to still be thinking about um, kind of what played out in those conversations? The effort was extremely important, um, solidifying the notion that climate is an environmental challenge that can be tackled. We have policy tools to tackle it and can be tackled at scale and tackled in a way that again, harnesses the force of finance instead of trying to be at odds with it. Now let's talk about how that innovation and insight today is at the heart of some of the most interesting policies that I see uh, coming to the fore. So at the national level, and I'll give you one at the local level, the national level, when we see things now like clean energy standards being proposed, at least some versions of those approaches would enable some tradeability. So where you would have a um, meet, more than meeting the requirement for a source of clean energy in one arena, uh, able to boost a more laggard performance in another arena so that you get action further, faster, uh, you, the innovations continue might sound like a different piece, but one of the most beautiful blendings of a mandate with some market mechanism is unfolding at a local level in building performance standards. I'm in love with these building performance <laughs> standards because climate so often has been about the big three, solar, wind, electric vehicles, and that's, that's great, we're all for it. But being in the buildings business, we know buildings are a huge part of the problem. 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and they haven't been front and center in terms of tackling climate. But this is where those foundational pieces of a direct mandate with some market mechanism come into place so these building performance standards are saying, uh-uh, <laughs> you have to reduce your carbon per square foot of your building by a determined amount every five year chunk, or you're gonna face a significant penalty. Now, some of them though capture in that the trading ability so that if you have a portfolio of buildings and the one in Midtown Manhattan, you can get to net zero next year, but the one in Southern Manhattan is going to take a little longer. You can balance it out. Um, those kinds of initiatives are so critical because assets like buildings are tough to green with just a generalized market signal. You really have to have those particularized regulations. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I like your thoughts on kind of blending the different mm -hmm. um, tools that we have available to us. Um, so 
I'm wondering if we can next go to kind of your reflections on how things have changed over the course of your time working on these issues. Um, and if you could talk about what you see um, has shifted over time um, that makes it more possible now to advance climate policy at the federal level than perhaps it was when we were considering waxing Markey or when the Clean Power Plan was being um, discussed in the EPA. Mm, you bet. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking that, uh, boy, it's a tale of two cities in terms of what's changed from my perspective. And part of it is an encouraging tale, and part of it actually is a discouraging tale, although auguring for, for action. Um, so part of what has changed to take the more challenging first is Mother Nature herself is removing all doubt that climate change is a problem. <clears throat> no more kind of if, it's as and now. And unfortunately, you know, many people, many families, um, and many properties have suffered, you know, the consequences of what we're seeing by way of climatic imbalance. That has certainly changed. I think COVID has changed uh, us as well and our sensibilities, our appreciation that things that we might have thought were impervious are fragile. You know, we've seen the fragility of our socioeconomic system. We've seen the fragility of human health. Uh, we've seen the fragility of our political system. And I think it enables people to see a little more clearly that ecological systems are fragile too. And when we are not proper stewards of those systems, bad things happen. So I think COVID has changed um, and, and in a way that's related to climate. Another on the not so happy side and makes action harder is on the unfortunate uh, polarization partisanship you know, around this issue. And, uh, you know, others on your panels here, I think will have better insight than me in terms of maybe some green shoots where we can find that common ground, but the common ground needs to be found. It's urgent on a, a matter of such consequences as the climate. Now on the encouraging side, there, um, I just have a whole lot of confidence now in the stick and stay of the action we're seeing. So technology, the, the price points in terms of how the cost of meaningfully slashing climate pollution has just so dramatically come down. I keep talking buildings, my goodness, you know, you can cut the efficiency of just about any building 50% that totally pays for itself. Um, so technology is another, uh, is, a, is a positive forcing function. Um, you know, I've, we've seen action now by companies that is deeper, richer, realer than I've seen in my 30 years of working these issues. Uh, and I think it's because going back to those fragile systems, going back to the real financial impact companies have had on their own assets, their operations, their supply chains. Um, they're getting really real, you know, about this. Johnson Controls is, you know, we're a net zero committed company uh, and, and, and it is an all enterprise activity, right? We've got those plans, we have our actions, this is serious. Um, and then I see some other things that just, should any of that get shaky, will really reinforce the seriousness of action. So the financial industry, for example, when you have the biggest equity investors in the world, like we have right now, making very clear that if you don't have a net zero plan and if your board is not taking direct responsibility for ensuring you meet it, that those biggest movers of capital in the world are gonna vote against you, that catalyzes seriousness of purpose. Uh, and I think the action by the SEC to begin to put the um, uh, rules and regulations for mandatory disclosure in place will, will doubly and triply reinforce that this is a C-suite activity taken enormously seriously 
And all of that, I think, taken together, the negatives and the positives put us in a place today where the imperative for action, I believe, has never been stronger. Yeah, it seems like the shift in how corporate America is looking at climate has um, just changed so significantly and um, really suggests the need for um, federal alignment with the real interest in moving forward on climate action. Um, exactly. That's a beautiful point. It's a beautiful point. I, I really hope we don't get stuck in terms of old stereotypes that if it's good for the environment, you know, it must be bad for business jobs and growth because companies aren't seeing it that way anymore. Right. Yeah. That so, changed. So, you know, to be stereotypical for a second, you know, so from a Republican point of view, hopefully the very determined action of companies across the country and across the globe will um, give space for Republicans to say, okay, this is an agenda I can be for. And hopefully for Democrats um, committed to the most effective environmental action, they'll have confidence to know that I can actually trust companies to come in and give real perspective and actually be part of trying to see progress happen. This is the moment where we can bridge the partisan divide. And I think corporate America can be part of the glue in bridging that divide and enabling common ground to be found. The perfect segue to our <laughs> next point of discussion. So, of course, you've worked um, part of your career in the public sector, part in the private sector. I'm wondering, um, you know, from where you sit today, um, at Johnson Controls, what are the priorities for federal climate policy? Um, what are you all thinking about in your day-to-day -day work on this topic? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, in terms of bipartisan action, I think that there were some terrific building blocks put in place in the energy bill that was successfully passed at the end of the, uh, the last uh, Congress. So smart buildings, build back better, making the uh, tax incentives around um, energy efficiency permanent. Um, all of those things are incredibly important. So what are we looking for and hoping to see now? A couple of things. We'd love to see a decarbonization title in the infrastructure bill. We hope there will be a comprehensive infrastructure bill. And we'd love to see an approach that would um, maybe set some performance standards so that if you want to build infrastructure uh, that will decarbonize, you know, a building, a transportation system, whatever it is, but will significantly decarbonize, then there could be some accelerated permitting, for example, to get that infrastructure built. So we'd love to see a very significant decarbonization title uh, to the infrastructure bill. Second, we really do hope we'll see federal legislation to green the grid, you know, to drive that solar, that wind, um, that smart grid that we need um, uh, and, and enable everyone to be able to plug into a grid that is actually delivering green electrons. And, you know, we, we get so disaggregated in terms of things, electricity being state or even local, but there's a huge role for the Department of Energy to play, for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to play, to enable us to get to an, an expedited green grid. I would also say, I hope we take that on in a net zero carbon way so that we are incentivizing, you know, carbon capture, direct air capture, uh, natural systems to capture carbon as well. But a third and big thing for us, coming back to the reality that buildings are a tough nut to crack and always get left behind and have to be decarbonized or else we're gonna be looking at 40% of that carbon footprint that is still brown, you know, not green. We'd love to see a push towards electrification in federal legislation and here's what's really important. If we're going to electrify buildings, which we think we should, you've got to mandate that those buildings become super efficient first, 
and you have to mandate that they are smart, that they are buildings that are flexible and can talk to the grid. The reason being that if we just dump all of that additional demand on the grid, the grid is going to crash. So we have to, we have to electrify buildings. We should do that by requiring that those buildings become super efficient and that all buildings and equipment in buildings are smart so that they become a grid stabilizing asset. Uh, so we would love to see federal legislation like that. California is moving on legislation. Many states are requiring electrification, requiring smart equipment and buildings. Let's see that at the federal level together with a clean energy standard and a, a decarbonization title in an infrastructure bill. Great. So that leads pretty closely into my last question for you um, this afternoon. Um, which is we have a lot of Hill staffers on um, live casting today and we are um, some some staffers might be new to these issue areas some may have worked on them for a long time but what would you say are kind of the key takeaways from looking back at the history of climate policy um, for staffers on the Hill today who are looking to figure out how to move forward um, work on climate during this Congress? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, there are some tried and true and proven tools um, that have worked so effectively uh, to not only clean our environment, but also have obviously led to technology innovations and job creation. So some tried and true tools, number one. Number two, that there are new and different allies that can be brought to the table, including the business community, and frankly, including state and local government that especially in the last four years have really jumped to the fore you know, with innovative new tools like these building performance standards or electrification mandates, for example. So tried and true tools, some new friends and allies with them, some new and innovative ideas. And I think um, in that mix, more than enough room to find common ground for some very meaningful pieces to enable us to work together to protect the climate. And I guess I would just say that the time is now. Um, you know, on the one hand, if we fail to act, we've seen some of the negative consequences. But on the other hand, the innovation that's happening digitalization, renewable energy, new kinds of approaches to how we move, how we travel, how we live our lives. Let's get it. Let's get it, get at it, and let's lead the world. I think that's a great note to wrap it up on. Um, Katie, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's wonderful to have you as a part of our uh, Congressional Climate Camp Briefing Series, and <laughs> we really appreciate you being with us today. So thank you so much. As I said, it's a joy to be back with ESI, so thank you for well, inviting me. You're welcome anytime. Um, <laughs> and back over to you, Dan. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Anna, for leading such a great conversation, and thank you, Katie, for helping our audience um, understand where we've been. And um, I think it's also really, really important for our audience today to hear uh, the perspective of someone in the in the private sector um, with a lot of public sector experience. There's a lot, perhaps there's more overlap in, um, uh, in terms of attitudes toward climate solutions there than maybe we think. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's great to have you back uh, with ESI today too. Um, we are going to um, begin our second segment in just a moment. Um, before I introduce our second speaker and turn it over to her, let me just um, provide a reminder that if you have questions um, over the course of today's sessions, um, you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online and ask us a question that way. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Um, if you missed anything that Anna and Katie talked about, um, no worries. Um, everything is available online, www.esi.org. You can watch the video. You can watch the whole webcast of the entire Congressional Climate Camp session today, all four speakers. You can watch individual segments, um, and you can also access written summaries and presentation materials as well. So we have it all there for you. 
Um, I hope you'll um, take a moment to visit us online and make use of our resources. And all of that is generally available for um, most every other briefing that we do as well. You can find an awful lot of resources um, at our website. It is my privilege now to introduce our second speaker of the day, Tina Johnson. Tina is the director of the National Black Environmental Justice Network and principal of Johnson Strategy and Development Consultants, which works with a broad international network, including groups from Europe and the United States, top uh, NGOs, governments, international foundations, and businesses. Tina specializes in US and international climate change policy, diplomacy, international climate change strategic development and advocacy, Tina's work investigates domestic and international policies around climate justice, sustainability, economics, energy, and climate change. Tina, it is great to see you, or soon to see you. You're turning your video on. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining our panel today. I'm really, really looking forward to your presentation. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Nice to be here. So, um, I can make myself useful with this. So I actually am uh, really excited to actually talk about the stakeholder impact on climate policy today um, with everyone, um, because it's such an important part of the work that um, that you all do um, if you're on the Hill or if you're in any way, shape or form um, engaged in uh, being part of transforming or impacting policy and in general, not just climate policy. Um, <clears throat> But I also want to root the conversation a bit in the stakeholder engagement space and just to note how important this is because of the methodology that it brings to bear on stakeholder engagement and the role of stakeholder uh, participation around the clinical, the scientific and the public health policy decision making aspects of things. Um, and just to also just note that, you know, that civil society stakeholders, you know, the goal, right, we all have this goal that we want to shape the direction and the outcomes of, in this instance, the climate processes, but whether you're working on the Black Lives Matters movement and you're working on uh, police reform or if you're, you know, mothers and mothers um, against drunk drivers and the work that they're doing around uh, driving under the influence of alcohol or any other substance, that these processes are really um, rooted in the role of stakeholders and their desire to shape um, and direct the way our policies actually work um, for us as a community. Um, and it's super important because if we don't have these kinds of stakeholder engagement opportunities or um, folks that want to do this work, we have just a bunch of politicians sitting around the table or in a pool of water debating things and getting stuck in the morass of, um, of what they think that people want versus hearing um, from the people themselves. And one of the examples that I like to use are um, just to sort of capture how important and how effective stakeholder engagement can be is is even if you're one person there was a guy called captain climate i think he's still around but when john mccain was running for president against george w bush this guy would show up at every um event and ask this question what's your plan until john mccain's like okay i'll look into it and he looked into it and came up with the mccain lieberman climate stewardship act so you know this one act by this one person um, as a stakeholder and caring about the planet actually did something that uh, was transformative uh, and so i just to note again that civil society's cooperation um, is critical and i use civil society to be inclusive of stakeholders right and it's in it's super important because of what this cooperation brings together um, from not just the outside approach, but also the inside approach. So if you have governments and civil society cooperating together, they're able to achieve a lot. And there are just a few points that I want to just you can read, but I just want to just add, you know, conducting that scientific analysis, the agenda and norm setting for policy, that that direct pressure that we have come to really appreciate and value around mobilization and the moral force um, to get things done um, is super important. Um, and then the narrative shaping, um, you know, that media um, storytelling, that communications aspect, these are all key components of how we actually in the realm of governance can um, influence the the policy pieces and that NGOs have become really important um, in this space stakeholders as a whole are super important in this space um, but it's also good to note that you know there are moments in which 
that that relationship between the the government and uh, civil society sometimes actually doesn't succeed in the way that one might hope. And so I want to just take us through a couple of pivotal moments within stakeholder advocacy and look back at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009. And you have the failure of countries to actually be ambitious and come up with meaningful agreements, but then you also have a failure of civil society um, at this COP as well. So although civil society had, you know, immensely been effective in shaping the meta narrative and the political expectations of the legally uh, binding deal in Copenhagen, um, it did not back it up with the outside influence and uh, didn't have sufficiently, uh, they didn't have a sufficient robust effort to change the politics on the inside of the negotiations. And for that matter, they were not really doing a much a good job at influencing um, how capitals prior to the summit would be responding to this. And so a lot of this in efficacy that um, is attributed to this, this, this failure is the deep fragmentation of civil society over fundamental issues. Um, so for example, there was a division um, over the Respective responsibilities of developing and developed countries, which manifested themselves um, in the split between climate justice and climate action coalitions. And so there was also this absence of unified civil society voices providing um, consistent pressure contributed. And this also contributed in turn to the clash of governments that characterized COP15. So this failure actually helped to do a really important thing for civil society um, at the international level, which also trickles down to the national level here in the United States. It helped to re they help the community to reimagine itself, to really reinvent itself and reinvigorate itself to becoming more effective. And you know, post Copenhagen, they really decided that we need to decide how we as a community can have develop a global civil society that actually pulls in from a collection of not just Western stakeholder campaigns, but also from the broader global community. And so it started to encompass developing country groups, as well as groups seeking policy intersections on issues like health, development, the economy, labor, faith, women and youth. Um, and so this was really important because this was the lead up to um, what many of you might recall um, the largest climate march in history. So you have in 2014 the climate summit um, and a new multi level governance architecture. Um, these two moments in um, climate change or climate policy advocacy is super important because uh, most folks who think about climate change um, or climate change policy or climate policy, think about it in the context of the United Nations framework on climate change. And then we think about it more on the domestic level. But these um, two events really help to shape how we could build a movement in a moment around influencing policymakers um, at the highest level. And so you had in 2014, the new climate environment, I'm sorry, climate economy report. Um, which helped to create the conditions for this really pivotal moment that led up to, that was a precursor to the 20, COP21. And so in 2014, in September 2014, you have the climate march, but at the same time, you have the UN General, um, Secretary General's um, summit as well. And civil society at this point is deeply engaged in shaping both the external and internal strategies for both of these events. And they accomplished a great deal. They accomplished one, they organized the global marches that poured 400,000 people into the streets. And they had thousands into hundreds of um, parallel activist events around the world. But then they were also instrumental in mobilizing um, this input into the climate, uh, the climate change narrative on by putting it on the front pages of every major newspaper uh, in the days before the summit that ensured that the heads of state attending the summit knew that they were being watched, that they needed to demonstrate responsiveness to the citizens. And it is said that, you know, while they were meeting in their summit and in, in the UN um, 
building that they could hear the voices of the people uh, calling to them to do uh, to act boldly on climate change. And so civil society proved um, to be particularly effective at harnessing the twin narratives of climate science and economics and at leveraging an emerging multi level governance architecture to create uh, this political space for climate leadership. You know, there's work to be done and there's a really, really amazing opportunity coming out of what we saw accomplished in uh, 2015 during the, the COP. Uh, and we had the, you know, the this Paris Agreement uh, domestically. We have a lot of opportunities here domestically, in particular to shift a more uh, nationally grounded implementation reg reg regime that's focused on individual states' climate commitments, while also requiring that we as civil society, that stakeholders become more effective at influencing domestic politics. So I just say that to say that we did a lot of work, but we still have work to do, but this was a great success um, here. And then post um Paris, you know, we have other great things that took place with stakeholders. You have the Greta effect, you have uh the work of of the young people around the world taking up the 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 ban the banner of Fridays for Future. Uh, you have the Green New Deal and um, the fact that it's rooted uh, was started by a group of young people. So again, we want to transform the way in which we understand how our nation governs and um and develops itself into this new green reality, this new green um, democracy. Uh, and these are super important moments to be aware of because they all are culminated in this understanding that it takes not just the boots on the ground, but also the work of the, of, of the analysis, of the actual um, policy wonks to really come together to create these opportunities that we can shift the paradigm to a place that we want. Um, but I really want to focus a little bit on um, environmental justice, um, because right now in the US, this is a movement and a moment that is happening um, front and center. And it's something that um, is really influencing the current administration uh, in the White House. and. Uh, maybe some of the offices on the Hill as well. Um, but I like to just preface this that, you know, environmental justice is not a new movement. It's been around since the 80s. Um, you know, it, it really got a lot of exposure because there was an explosive um, report that came out around the burdens um, that disproportionately impacted uh, communities that were in that were minority and low income it really showed the massive disparities and the burden that these communities were were shouldering for environmental degradation and so the issues um, existed and had been recognized previously but what happened was in 1982 in a county in north carolina called warren county uh, there were thousands of tons of pcp ridden soil which was intentionally dumped in a facility in an african-american community even though the community is like we don't want this and that incident and others like it really sparked um, this movement into uh, addressing the health burdens and uh that were being borne by these communities that were culminating and it culminated in the publishing of a report called toxic waste and race in 1987 um, and so over the decades this work and this uh, this movement really started to gain momentum and the group sought you know governmental action to ensure that the um, hardships of the pollution would not uh, actually that it wouldn't go beyond what they were suffering they really were seeking a way to find a way in which that they could prevent other communities that were like them in the sense that they were already being disproportionately impacted and were already facing discrimination that they would be able to have a, a means by which they can empower themselves um, to stop these things from continuing so they use legal means they use legislative action um, and they also stayed really true to it has stayed true to its uh, its roots it's rooted in community activism um, and it's leading um, this narrative currently from the grass, grassroots up to the federal government around the need to take these issues seriously, not just in the context of, of local government, but also in um, national uh, policy approaches. 
And one of the most successful wins for the environmental justice movement is the executive order 12898, which was signed in, um, signed by Clinton. And this established the environmental justice offices in the EPA and DOJ and across other federal agencies. Uh, so where we are now with this movement is that it is, you know, I like to call it the golden child at the moment. Um, you know, it is uh, currently really influ influencing the approach and the way in which not just the, the government is looking at uh, equity and justice um, and the needs of environmental um, communities, whether you're looking at um, air pollution or water, water pollution, but the totality of it. But you're also seeing this um, being sort of a reckoning of sorts within the environmental movement as a whole um, to really bring together the need to to have environmental justice at the core of the framework that we're designing and developing. And so I like to say that EJ, the environmental justice movement is a moment that has been a long time coming. Um, and so what we're seeing is the work of 30 years for some of these folks of really digging deep and digging in um, to get to this place where we can see how stakeholder engagement really can be transformative and has the potential to be um, to progress us to a further space in which we have more equity and justice across the board. Um, I want to just conclude and just say that um, stakeholders are effective um, when they can strategically integrate their issues into the broader concerns that we're facing. And I would say that within the context of climate change, stakeholders have been really successful in ing integrating the climate change framing um, of the issues that uh, that I've just laid out for across the board for many communities, many countries, um, with more traditional concerns around air pollution, land rights, and in, and environmental justice. And so the role of um, stakeholders, I cannot impress upon you um, enough that uh, collectively we do a lot more um, when more effectively when we are fighting for things and uh, engaged in things that really resonate for across communities um, and not just across um, silos. Um, and so I um, want to say thank you uh, for just the opportunity to be here and, and, and I will open it up or give it back to you, Dan, for questions if there are any. Thank you um, so much, Tina, for a great presentation. Um, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, we do have some time for a discussion and I'm interested in um, digging a little bit deeper into a couple of the things you said. Um, maybe I'll start with sort of one of the last points you made and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit because I can only write so fast. Um, you said something to the effect of, um, uh, this work is done best when there is a strategic integration of climate change into ongoing debates. And I'm wondering um, if, you can, if you can think from your experience of times when that's been successfully done, when climate has been strategically integrated into the federal policymaking process. Um, I'm wondering if you could provide an example or two that you've seen that worked well, and, and perhaps an example of two where it didn't work well, or it was too much of an afterthought to make much of a difference. Yeah, I, I think that it's a good question because um, the answer is, of course, there are things that have worked well when you've integrated policy. I mean, Cal California is a really wonderful example of climate, a state that gets the need to really integrate climate policy into the way in which it wants to operate, whether it's through electric vehicle, um, um, electric vehicles or uh, greenhouse gas reduction and taking the lead when the federal government has sort of lacks behind and now is the poster child for all things green. You look to California. Um, but I would, so, you know, you have this, you have, um, these are not, um, <laughs> These are not necessarily uh, policies that I would support. I want to just preface that, but that they are there. So you have Reggie in some states where you know they're looking at ways that they can use this system that's part of the international community to to bring down greenhouse gas emissions and to really find a way that um, communities, that state level action can take hold and really start to look at what the needs are at the local level to engage in um, this approach to um, 
to being a champion on on the climate and also looking at ways to enhance innovation and opportunities for communities um, as we're moving into this this new future that looks green for all of us. But there are always these um, these caveats because uh, not most of the policy that we see that's implemented doesn't always take a multi-stakeholder approach into consideration. It's usually your first speaker spoke about business and, you know, business is super important. The economic development is super important, but when that is more important than the actual cumulative impacts on communities that are suffering the most or disproportionately impacted uh, because the modeling that's done doesn't represent the need to take into consideration equity, justice, health impacts, or cumulative impacts. Um, the policies, even though they're promising at reducing greenhouse gases, don't necessarily promise a healthier, cleaner, safer, um, pollution-free environment for communities that need it the most. Um, so I, I just like to put that in context because there is a lot of really good policy um, that we are seeing enacted but there are flaws in it because of what they leave out um, in, in their implementation and, and the impacts. Thanks. Um, over time, um, different stakeholders have been invited to these conversations. They've, invited to, they've been invited to the, the, the policymaking table. Um, how has the landscape of um, advocates and stakeholders that are included early in the policymaking process, how has that landscape changed? And in your opinion, has it, is it changed enough? Where would you, how would you like to see that landscape um, perhaps evolve even further? I, th I think that, you know, there's always something to be said for um, our humbling, the moments that humble us. I think the 2016 election was a humbling moment. Um, for many folks uh, on one side, <laughs> for others it was a champion moment, but for a lot of folks who work in the space around climate policy, um, going from a, an administration that was really pro, um, well, as much as pro as Obama was, but doing a lot more on climate th than he had done in the beginning and ending it in a really strong way at the end of his term, and then going into the next um, administration where this didn't, this same commitment did not exist. It really caused the community to take a moment back and reflect on, you know, all that it had accomplished, who did they accomplish it with, and were enough of the people that should be at the table at the table. And I think those moments, those humbling moments make it so that you have to think through when your policy is like this is good for everybody but you don't have everyone there then folks are like yeah i can support it but it it, it doesn't really meet our needs you really create a, a disconnect between the folks on the ground and their needs and the policy approach and what you tell people they need and what i have found is that people people know what what works in their communities, they know what they're looking for, and doing that little bit of work, which is the hard work of actually engaging stakeholders meaningfully, actually taking the time and sitting like a weekend and just saying, give, tell us what you're thinking, let's have relationship, let's communicate with each other, share with us your ideals, share with us your ideas, share with us your fears, your concerns, the buy-in at the end of that is immense because most people just want to be heard. They just want to know that you heard them, that you're considering them in the process that you're taking up, that you're taking up, and that they can see themselves reflected in the outcome. So I think that genuine um, engagement, that uh, connection, connecting to you know each other in a different way that's not transactional. I think that that's the biggest change, but that's also the, again, it's the biggest change that still needs a lot of work, um, but I think it's there. I think it's starting. That's great. I, I love that point. When we were working on our coastal resilience briefing series in 2019 and 2020, that issue came up over and over and over again. The idea that community engagement is not just sending out a one-way communication. It's actually engaging. It implies a two-way, and we had a speaker in our Louisiana briefing, coastal briefing, and he said something to the effect of when he was actually, when his community was actually engaged, he felt like he was being included rather than just being told about what the decision was. 
And it just meant so much to him that someone actually really valued his input. And uh, I just, that, uh, that really stuck with me through the rest of the series. And it's something that I think comes out in our report. Um, I have one more question for you um, before we pivot to our next speaker. Um, there are a lot of congressional staff watching us right now. Um, and many of them um, are going to be involved in all sorts of <laughs> climate related um, policy deliberations in the next couple months. What would you, from your experience, what are the one, what are the most important lessons that you've learned about how to do this the right way that you would like them to keep in mind as they talk to their constituents, as they talk to interest groups, as they talk to their bosses about how climate policy should take shape this Congress? Yeah, I mean, I think that one, um, congressional staffers, they have, a, they, they have a heavy lift, right? I mean, I don't think anyone's overstaffed in these offices. <laughs> and uh, the issues are, are, are plenty. But I, I would say that I, I do think it's important to understand, if, I think if, this is my personal thing, I think if the question is, is there equity, is there justice in what we are putting forward? Like having that be a framework, not just the lens, a framework. Can we, and have we consulted the folks that are gonna be most impacted by this um, in a way that we can actually hear them versus in a way that we just need to say that we heard them, check that box, push out legislation or push out a bill that doesn't take into consideration the broader space. And I think it's super important for folks to realize that just because it comes from a think tank doesn't mean that it's well thought, <laughs> right? Like, and that that extra, those extra eyes from other stakeholders outside of the, I guess what they call them, the brain trust, um, expand that brain trust. Because even if you aren't an economist, you do know what you what your community wants if you're on the ground doing the work. You have a different perspective. You bring something to the table that resonates with the people who actually are gonna vote for it in, in the space that your that your congressperson or your senator is is in. And if those folks are not engaged in a meaningful, authentic way, it really makes it hard for people to hold on to something and say, I can champion this because I see myself reflected in it. So I do think if anything, it's really that authentic, the heavy, the, the easy lift, but the heavy lift of engaging from a place of wanting to do, to be effective. And you can be effective when you engage people and, and, and get their input. Um, they may not buy in a hundred percent, but if they feel like they've given you input, felt like they've been heard, maybe they don't come out and say, oh, this so-and-so didn't do this, but they can say, we had a conversation, we weren't in agreement, but we can see where they're coming from. I call it alignment. You don't always get agreement, but maybe you get alignment. And, and that's, I think it's really important. Thank you so much, um, Tina, for sharing your time with us today and your perspective and expertise. It means a lot for you to join us today. Thank you so much. And um, um, uh, I thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if you missed any of Tina's presentation, and trust me, if you did, you will need to go back and watch it. Um, it's going to be archived along with Katie's presentation on the website. Um, we've reached the halfway point-ish uh, in our um, panel today. So Katie McGinty with Johnson Controls, she spoke about turning points, uh, or key turning points in climate policy history. We just heard Tina about an advocate's perspective, climate policy here and uh, then and now, and what's changed and what needs to continue to change in order to, for us to get what we need to get done. Um, now we are going to hear uh, from our third panelist. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce Laurel Harbridge Young. She is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and a faculty fellow at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. She received her PhD in 2009 from Stanford University. Her research focuses on the challenges to reaching bipartisan compromises in American politics. In her research, she studied Congress, state legislator, legislatures, legislators, and legislatures, uh, as well as the American public. Laurel, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I can't wait for your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so I'm going to be taking a slightly different perspective than the previous panelists, um, drawing on my work as a political science scholar. 
And so I want to share a couple of insights from my research about the importance of building bipartisan coalitions in Congress and about public views on bipartisanship and compromise. Because especially with the very narrow majorities that the current Democratic Party has in Congress, when thinking about how to tackle legislative initiatives on energy, the environment, and climate change, it's going to be particularly important to think about where bipartisanship and compromise is possible. And I think, unfortunately, there's often a perception in contemporary politics that bipartisanship and compromise is bad politics. That we hear about legislators fearing primary challengers if they compromise or if they work with the other side. Think that maybe their legislation might be ignored in favor of, you know, the types of priorities that are the messaging priorities of the majority party or the minority party. And my work suggests that it's not necessarily bad politics and that Congress as a whole, that individual legislators, um, that both of them can benefit from crafting bipartisan compromises. Um, and we'll leave some time for a, a Q and A uh, kind of back and forth discussion after my opening remarks here. We can talk a little bit more there about um, this misperception and the fact that legislators do seem to have a misperception about how the public thinks about compromise. So I wanna begin by thinking about the value of bipartisanship. So first off, bipartisanship is important for Congress as a whole. So when we think about um, the need for Congress to govern, that the majority party in particular cares about a record of success, um, that in the, even in the highly polarized period that we're in today, it's important to keep in mind that most major laws still pass with significant bipartisan support in at least one chamber. So in fact, there's recent work by fellow political scientist James Curry and Francis Lee, who point out and you know, show with convincing evidence that over time, uh, bipartisanship is roughly the same now as it was 30 years ago in terms of the bills that become law. There are lots of bills that don't become law that are party line votes, messaging bills, and so forth. But things like the Affordable Care Act or the Trump tax cut that passed on party line votes are the exception, not the rule. And particularly in these recent time periods, it's also important to keep in mind that the successful cases of bipartisanship often entail working with party leaders in both parties early in the legislative process and not simply trying to pick off a few legislators from the minority party late in the process, basically just by making you know, a few concessions at the end. Sometimes that can work, but oftentimes it may be more valuable to kind of build a broader stakeholder process and bipartisanship earlier on. Second, bipartisanship can be valuable for individual legislators too. So, Legislators who can draw in more bipartisan co-sponsors on their bills have higher legislative effectiveness measured as their success in moving the bills they introduce through committee to floor votes and into law. So the figure here shows some estimates from some ongoing work I have with Craig Volden and Alan Wiseman, who run the Center for Effective Lawmaking. And we looked at how legislators' ability to draw in bipartisan co-sponsors on their bills affected their legislative effectiveness at each stage. So action in committee with the AIC, action beyond committee marked by ABC, bills that pass one chamber and bills that become law. And in both the House and the Senate, the figure shows that an increase in bipartisanship boosts members' legislative effectiveness. So for instance, House representatives who attract a one standard deviation larger proportion of bipartisan co-sponsors co on their bills experience about an eight to 14% increase in their bills receiving committee attention, passing the House and becoming law. For the Senate, it's about a 10% increase in these activities. And of course, for all many of you watching, you know as staffers, that the staffers play a really important role in building these bipartisan collaborations. They build the relationships over time with other offices and other staffers. And this is why uh, longer tenure can matter. And evidence suggests that staffers who do have longer tenure may be more um, effective at um, helping build bipartisan collaborations. So the next point I wanna focus on is thinking about what my research has found about public opinion on bipartisanship and compromise, and how particularly this may relate in the domains of energy, environment, and climate policy. So first and more generally speaking, in both my work and in the work of others, for instance, Jennifer Wolak at the University of Colorado, research consistently finds that the public does generally prefer compromise. And this is especially true when the alternative is policy gridlock. You know, of course, people might prefer victory for their own preferred side, but compromise is generally viewed favorably. 
um, whereas gridlock typically is viewed unfavorably. People are frustrated by inaction and they do see compromise as a necessary step to getting things done. However, just how bad gridlock is seen can depend on the issue. So in one study that we conducted, um, we ran a survey experiment where we varied the outcome of the legislative process. Either it resulted in a successful compromise between the two parties, in a policy victory for one party or the other, or in legislative gridlock. And we ran this study on two different issues. So study one was on energy policy. And this is something that you might think about as being a consensus issue. So people on both sides of the aisle shared the end goal of greater energy independence. But also on a second issue, study two, which was gun control, which is not a consensus issue, that partisans on each side of the aisle tend to want a different end goal and don't necessarily share the same kind of outcome in terms of you know, having fewer guns um, in the hands of citizens. And then we asked people's approval of how Congress was handling each of the issues. And what we see in both studies is that a win for one's own party boosts congressional approval slightly relative to a compromise. So we see that the predicted or the mean approval is slightly higher for the own win relative to compromise. Um, and so this suggests that, yes, you know, sure, people want their side to kind of win their preferred policy to be the victory, but compromise is a pretty good alternative too. The really, I think, interesting thing here and kind of suggesting about why it matters kind of what issue we're tackling and also how we frame these issues is that on the consensus issue of energy, so shown here in study one, gridlock was viewed as the worst outcome. So people even preferred a policy that favored the opposing party to gridlock on the legislation. So this points, I think, to the importance of appealing to shared end goals that people might have. The public support for action, even through the means that are not their most preferred, can be higher when you do appeal to these shared end goals. And of course, in the domain of energy and environment, this may be an easier strategy on some issues than on others. So recent Pew surveys show that both Democrats and Republicans have increased their support for making environmental protections a priority, though a significant partisan gap still remains. And climate change in particular um, has a very large partisan gap. So here of all the issues that Pew recently surveyed, it had the largest gap in terms of um, people just thinking it should be a priority. So not even necessarily on what should be done about it, but even just as a priority, that only 21% of Republicans versus 78% of Democrats thought it should be a priority. And so I think maybe this speaks a little bit back to some of the earlier speakers uh, with Katie McGinty and others thinking about where can we find aspects of climate policy where there is more of a shared end goal? Places where in corporate America, their interests and incentives in kind of moving towards kind of greener buildings may align with climate activists and others. Um, it's not necessarily to mean that this is gonna be a possible route uh, to appeal, appeal to and shared end goals on every issue, but it's one possibility for thinking about um, how to get garner broader support for compromise um, and for action from people on both sides of the aisle. But again, I think the other point here is just keeping in mind that regardless of the issue, successful compromises tend to be viewed favorably by the public and result in higher evaluations of how Congress is handling an issue. The next part of my research in this area has found that people on average reward individual legislators for supporting these compromises. So as part of my recent book with uh, my collaborators, Sarah Anderson and Daniel Butler, we surveyed a national sample of Americans. And we asked them their stance on several issues. And then we shared that their senator had either voted for a compromise on the issue that led to the bill's passage or voted against a compromise leading to the bill's failure. And then we asked people about their approval of the senator as well as their vote intention in the next general election and for co-partisans in the next primary election. And what we found was that supporting compromise boosts evaluations of the senator relative to rejecting compromise. This is true for approval shown here in the top panel and also for their general election vote in the bottom panel. It also holds for the full sample, for just co-partisans who share the um, partisanship of the senator, for opposing partisans, and for independents. And for co-partisans, it also boosts, boosts uh, the primary election vote share as well. And even among co-partisans, self-identified primary voters boost their evaluations of the senator when learning that he or she supported the compromise. So here approval is in the top panel 
and primary vote intention is in the bottom panel. So we see primary voters um, on the first group here. We also see a positive effect for strong partisans, for individual donors, for those who view uh, the Tea Party or Indivisible movement favorably. It's only for the most ideological voters that we don't see a positive effect, but there's also no punishment either. So here it's just suggesting that it doesn't really matter to people's evaluations uh, whether the senator compromised or doesn't compromise. But for all of these other groups, on average, people reward the legislator who engaged in compromise and helped pass legislation as opposed to one who rejected the compromise and helped kill the piece of legislation. So I think these findings highlight that bipartisanship and compromise can help members find legislative success, can help parties pass major public laws, and also can help legislators boost their support in the public. And I'll go ahead and wrap up uh, my introductory remarks here, and then we can kind of continue some conversation with Anna or Dan. <laughs> Fantastic, uh, Laurel, thank you so much. Um, uh, we need to have more political science um, panels. It's so interesting, I love your research and congratulations on your book um, published last year, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, I have lots of questions. Um, one of my questions is you talked about successful compromise. And I think, um, you know, I'm curious about what factors might sabotage compromise or derail compromise, and also whether those are more common at the beginning of maybe as compromise is forming, or if those are risks sort of as compromises are trying to endure, you know, sort of various political pressures from, you know, the pressure cooker of the capital. Yeah, so I think when we think about um, where kind of compromises can fail, so this is going to turn a little bit from what I was talking about before about kind of where public opinion stands to drawing on some of my other work that's looked at um, the perceptions of legislators as well as the actions of legislators, um, processes within Congress and state legislatures. And so one of the um, I think challenges and places where compromise can break down is that legislators have a perception sometimes that primary voters will punish them for making compromises. So as I just showed with the evidence here, that there's not actually a lot of evidence for that. This is, I think, more of a misperception than it is an accurate perception. Um, but I think that when legislators worry that some of these kind of most committed activists in an area would kind of turn their back on them and kind of support a primary challenge, um, kind of stop supporting them because of their efforts to build a compromise, that can be a place that um, it can be derailed. Another, um, and this, I guess, I don't know if it's necessarily at odds with um, the previous speakers, but, you know, I think you know, the, having the stakeholders involved is obviously really important to you know, having good policy and to getting broader buy-in. Um, but I think one of the challenges with, you know, some stakeholders involved is that some stakeholders can kind of have more of a approach focused on principles rather than pragmatism. And I think that for legislators, um, pragmatism is often what is needed, that they need to focus on what can be incrementally done to move policy in a direction that achieves a goal, even if they can't get everything. And so, you know, we might think that they need to accept half a loaf rather than hold out to try to get the whole loaf. And sometimes I think that interest groups, both early in the process as well as late in the process, can kind of prove stumbling blocks here. So you can have, you know, instances where interest groups score votes um, in ways that tell legislators not to support a compromise because it kind of, only goes part way, but not all the way towards what they want. Um, they can also, you know, try to muddy the waters earlier on and kind of they, they pick off legislators and, you know, get members who might be more ideologically extreme to, to stop supporting the legislation. And, you know, I think we saw this historically. Um, so back in the early 2000s, when Congress was considering legislation to improve wilderness protections for the San Rafael swell in Utah, there were some environmental interests um, who opposed the legislation because it did not provide full wilderness designation. So even though the proposal had considerably more protection for the land than existed at the time, um, it didn't provide full wilderness designation. And so they opposed the legislation. It led to many uh, liberal legislators kind of losing their support for this legislation. And ultimately the sponsor of the legislation pulled it from the floor. So nothing was done instead of kind of an incremental approach again, because of this kind of perfect being the enemy of the good in a sense. 
Um, you said something that sort of made me think. Um, individual members are, um, you know, they have. I'm, I'm curious if your if your research found any tension between maybe what an individual member feels is in her, her in his or her best interest with respect to his or her constituents or district uh, versus maybe what maybe what the party is hoping for an outcome. Um, did your research uncover like where are there some issues that maybe you've um, studied where individual members have maybe a little bit more leeway to become compromisers or to become to show an independent streak um, or are there others that maybe the party to the extent that the party or apparatus has you know that amount of control they can say no actually this isn't we're going to move on from this one and not compromise a whole lot here so i think certainly there are a lot of places where we can think about um some cases where legislators interest in the party's interests align and other cases where legislators interests in the parties don't align um it gets to be i think a little bit of a, a complex scenario because i think it also matters whether their party is in the majority or the minority and also whether they have unified government or divided government so the more you have divided government, particularly in the times that we've had split control of the House and Senate, neither party cares as much about getting stuff done, and they can focus a lot more on what we might call messaging priorities. So they don't actually care about compromising because they're just going to pass the buck and blame the other party in chamber for why things don't get done. Um, and so there, the parties don't necessarily care about compromising, and it might be some individual legislators, particularly in more kind of competitive you know, swing districts who want to show I am willing to work across the aisle. I'm trying to really tackle issues that are important to my constituents. On the other hand, you might have a scenario with unified government where the majority party does have an incentive to govern and produce a record of success, even if it is a more incremental policy. And so they may be particularly attentive to what the needs are of the kind of more moderate members, the kind of pivotal legislators who might be needed to make deals. And there it actually might be the legislators on the more ideological wing of the party who don't want to work with the party leaders who get frustrated by all the concessions that are being have are you know having to be made to get the you know pivotal legislators so you know how does you know bernie sanders feel about the concessions being made to joe manchin or on issues where the filibuster holds to nine more republicans um in terms of what policy would need to look like Great, thanks. And I, I should have mentioned before I asked that question that one of the members of our audience had a similar question. So I tried to weave those two together. Um, your work touches on the connection between public polling and sort of how individual members themselves understand the, their political standing with their constituents. Um, what are those linkages? How does polling affect um, how a politician, how a member of Congress, um, positions him or herself with respect to issues and, and deciding whether or not compromise is in their interest or not? So I think this is a really interesting question and I think a challenging one because on the one hand, we have pretty good uh, public opinion polls at a national level, maybe even at a state level, um, but at a district level, we don't have as good a polling. And so I think as a result, legislators and their staff end up relying a lot more on the people who contact them. But we know that the people who contact the offices are not a random sample of their constituents. Um, and of course, you know, legislators and their staff on the one hand can recognize that they can say, oh, of course, these people aren't a ra random sample. But we also have evidence that seems to suggest that their voices still up, end up being disproportionately important. Um, and so, you know, when they hear from these engaged and vocal people, they're going to tend to hear from the people who maybe do oppose the compromise or who you know care so much about the issue that this is the only issue that matters to them and if the legislator doesn't vote the way they want you know they're not going to support the legislator and as i alluded to before in my previous comments i this is where we can end up with legislators having misperceptions of what constituents want so in the research that i mentioned for my book we focused on compromises that move policy part way, but not all the way to what legislators wanted. And in some of our work um, that we studied state legislators, um, what we found was that 58% of state legislators thought that their primary voters were either somewhat or very likely to punish them for compromising on policy. Only 26% thought that general election voters would want them to compromise. Uh, we asked a similar question and found that 59% of primary vote of, or 59% of legislators thought that a primary voter would want a member of Congress to vote no on a compromise bill, killing it. 
Um, and so that was actually the exact same scenario that we had then used in the public opinion survey that I showed in the slides. So the state legislators, and I think this you know, lesson applies to federal legislators as well, overwhelmingly thought that primary voters opposed the compromise. But when we surveyed their very primary voters, we found no, primary voters on average still favored the compromise. Um, and so I think this misperception can lead them to be, I think, fearful of kind of what would happen in the primary election, especially right now, you know, where so many districts are safe for parties in the general election. Um, and this misperception spills over into kind of views on issues more broadly. Um, so drawing on some work by some other political scientists, um, so from work by um, Hurdle Fernandez, Mildenberger, and Stokes, they asked um, congressional staffers, what percent of constituents in your member's district would agree with the following set of policy statements? And then they looked at district level polling to compare it. So they looked at views on carbon regulation, on repealing the Affordable Care Act, on gun sale uh, background checks, um, minimum wage level and infrastructure spending. And what they found was that staffer perceptions were far more extreme than the public's actual policy preferences. So Democratic staffers would overestimate constituent support for carbon regulation, Republicans would underestimate constituent uh, support. And they would have bigger misperceptions the more they had contact with interest groups in these areas. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and actually that kind of leads into my last question um, for our discussion today. We have, you, you heard me ask Tina and Anna asked Katie, there are a lot of staff watching us. This is a very popular briefing today. Um, based on your research, based on your experience, based on your sort of expertise, um, what advice would you give to staff people who are either currently working or about to start working on climate policy um, that might help them navigate sort of the, the tricky waters around bipartisanship and compromise um, over the course of the rest of the Congress? Yeah, so I think that there are a couple of things that I would emphasize. So the first is to just emphasize what I said earlier, which is that building bipartisan uh, coalitions and compromises can be good for policymaking and for good for politics, that it can help Congress as a whole pass legislation, it can help individual legislators develop a record of legislative success, and it can be good for them electorally as well. Um, the second point, uh, which ties to the last thing we were talking about, is kind of misperceptions is that I think that legislators and their staff should do more to seek out the opinions of a broader um, kind of group of constituents than just those who call the office or subscribe and respond to constituent newsletter polls. And I think here there's some really interesting work by Michael Neblo at Ohio State and his colleagues who have partnered with some members of Congress to hold virtual town halls with representative samples of constituents. And I think that he actually testified before the House Select Committee on Modernization yesterday. Um, in terms of thinking about some of his work on civic engagement and um, getting more people to kind of know what their member of Congress is doing and more of their members of Congress to know what the people think. Um, and then the very last thing that I would mention is that sometimes negotiations um, that are lead to successful compromises might have more success if some element of those are conducted in private. So I think transparency is often touted as a real gold standard in the policymaking process and that privacy is a problem. But even the founding fathers had recognized that they needed privacy to work out the deals of writing the constitution. That This wasn't something that could be done with kind of prying eyes and everybody tearing apart every part of the kind of negotiation. And so by no means am I saying that legislators should hide their votes. Legislators should take their roll call votes and be on the record and constituents should know what stances they take. But I also think that we should make it more acceptable that some elements of these negotiations happen behind closed doors, that the stakeholders come together and you hash out details and you say, you know, here's what I'd be willing to give if you could meet me, you know, part way and say that in a real kind of truthful way without having, you know, the media or, in, you know, the closest kind of lobbying interest groups or, um, you know, primary voters or stuff like that watching and saying, oh, this person, you know, is giving up the principles. Um, so I'll wrap it up there and thank you again for the invitation to be part of this. Well, thank you so much. And you're just, you're making me think that that's really only possible with trust, right? Members have to know and trust each other to have those frank conversations without, you know, fear of, you know, someone under the table live tweeting um, the conversation or making the conference call <laughs> publicly available or something like that. Um, 
Laurel, thank you so much for bringing your research to our audience today. Um, and uh, congressional staff in the audience, uh, Laurel gave you lots of practical advice, but it's actually really fun to read political science research about how these institutions function. Um, so um, uh, Laurel has a book out, but there's lots of other great um, histories and um, treatises out there. I've always been a Ross Baker fan, Ross K. Baker fan. Um, his work on House and Senate is just so fascinating. So definitely encourage everybody to take a look at that. So go visit your local library when it's safe again to do so. Thank you, Laurel. We are going to turn now to our fourth speaker in our fourth segment. Uh, and it is my, I have lots of privileges today. I get to introduce wonderful people to this panel. My fourth privilege of the day is to introduce Anna Unruh Cohen. Uh, Anna is staff director of the United States House of Representatives Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Previously, she was managing director of government affairs at the Natural Resources Defense Council and the NRDC Action Fund. Uh, during nearly two decades of policy experience, including many on Capitol Hill, she has served as the Director of Energy, Climate, and Natural Resources for Senator Edward Markey, Ed Markey, Deputy Staff Director of the Natural Resources Committee uh, Democratic Staff, Deputy Staff, Staff Director and Chief Scientist uh, of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, and as an LA, a Legislative Assistant, and then Representative Markey's personal office. Anna, it's great to see you uh, today. Thank you for joining our panel. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the invitation. It's always great to join EESI, who um, have always been a resource for me through my whole career on Capitol Hill, and um, also to be on a panel with um, three other really um, fantastic uh, women um and to learn from them and their perspectives today of course just as i start my kitten boomy wants to join so here's boomy we'll put him down um hopefully everybody's uh also having great uh working from home experiences still um so as you heard from my bio, I've, uh, I've been around uh, a while up here and seen, seen a lot. Um, I'm actually, my educational background is uh, in climate science. And then um, many of you are probably familiar with the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, Fellowship. So that's how I got my start on Capitol Hill, um, kind of fresh out of grad school and have been uh, mostly on Capitol Hill since then, um, but working on climate and policy um, all of that time uh, since the fall of 2001. So I think one of the main points I want to make to start is um, that there is a climate policy is almost every policy. Um, you know, we look to back to 2009 um, when the House passed Waxman Markey. Uh, we're looking to uh, hopefully here in a few months when we um, do some more work and we think of those as climate bills. Um, but in reality, um, especially in the energy space, every energy bill is a climate bill because um, what we decide to do um, on energy, um, you know, means emissions going up or going down um, or changing in some way. And so, you know, that's sort of my first point to everyone is um, it's always been the case that um, much of the legislation we pass has an impact on the climate. And in this day and age, we have to really um, be cognizant and uh, of that. And as we're moving um, you know, all of the pieces of legislation that we, we may be able to move, um, you know, as, as people who want to advance climate actions, we need to be thinking about what, what can we put in uh, here or how is this going to bring um, benefits to the climate or to people who are, um, you know, trying to address issues in their, in their own communities. Um, and, you know, I think that's pretty clear when you're talking about climate and energy bills. Um, obviously, it's not dealing with cl the climate crisis is not just about reducing emissions. We already have impacts 
um, that we're feeling already. Um, and so I would also add that, you know, whenever we're dealing with a disaster bill or thinking about some of our responses to natural hazards, that, that is another opportunity um, and something we need to deal consciously with um, when we to think about climate adaptation and, and resilience. So really, you know, in my um, time on the Hill, we, you know, not only did we have, we had an energy bill in 2005, we had an energy bill in 2007, where we were able to increase um, fuel economy standards. In 2008, actually, in the, in the response to the financial crisis then, is actually one of the key moments for solar deployment, because we passed a long-term solar, um, solar tax credit extension in that um, late 2008 bill, um, which really helped um, spread solar in the last decade. Then in 2009, um, you know, we had a recovery act um, that was really instrumental to keeping um, clean energy going. Um, so, you know, even before we got to um, 2009 and being able to, to put in, uh, to pass climate, uh, the climate bill through the House with three Republicans, I mean, with eight Republicans um, going to the, going to the point of bipartisanship, um, you know, we had already been doing um, a lot of things that, that had that impact. Um, and so then um, having failed to get a climate bill to the president's desk um, in the 2009 and 10 timeframe, and then Republicans taking back control of the House starting in 2011, um, you know, the opportunities for legislative action really fell off. And that's when the Obama administration, um, you know, started to look at their existing authorities um, and I shouldn't say started. I mean, there actually had been, um, there's a long history of, um, of the EPA in particular looking at their Clean Air Act authority that goes right back to the Clinton administration. Um, so it wasn't um, just a new thing that they, they picked up at that time. And then, and there had been uh, a number of issues around auto efficiency that, that also set the stage. Um, for um, for the Obama EPA to, to then develop the Clean Power Plan. And all along when we were legislating or trying to legislate in 2009, um, you know, we knew that um, this regulatory authority was there, um, but that we would be able to design a better program for dealing with greenhouse gases if, um, if we could, um, if, we, if Congress could act. Um, so um, since Congress did not act, um, in the end, um, we uh, put together, or the administration started moving on um, on their clean power plan. Um, and, uh, you know, I think had a huge amount of, to, uh, to Laurel's point, um, you know, there was a lot of engagement with stakeholders um, through that process um, at the Obama, uh, Obama EPA. Um, and, you know, the proposal they put out changed um, in significant ways uh, before they finalized it in 2015. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, then we hit the legal um, challenges, um, which, um, you know, ultimately stayed it. Um, and then when the Trump administration came in, they um, worked to unwind it. Um, and so, um, you know, we had had a long time of there of not dealing with um, climate and energy really up on Capitol Hill um, until, uh, you know, the end of 2020. And so probably many of you were here and know that we passed a massive piece of legislation um, right at the end of 2020. And it was important for COVID response, for keeping the government running, but it also had a lot of pent up 
energy policy um, that um, committees and members have been working on um, really for multiple Congresses. So, um, you know, huge amount on uh, for innovation. We extended some of the clean energy tax credits again. And then I think really importantly at LOST um, largely was um, the components to deal with HFCs which in, um, in driving those, um, in, in having a pathway to get, get rid of those um, will actually have a huge um, uh, benefit to climate and it will help us avoid on the order of a whole you know, degree Celsius of temperature increase. I mean, not a whole, a half, um, 0 0.5 um, that we otherwise might expect. So um, huge, huge wins. Um, comparatively on the legislation there. Now, compared to what we need to do and what the science says to do, we obviously um, have a lot more um, that we need to, to go ahead to, to further. And, um, you know, on the adaptation and resilience side, um, the 2018 um, Disaster Reform Act uh, put in place something called the Bus Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program over at FEMA, um, which is a sort of pre-disaster mitigation program um, that now um, is stood up and getting funding that will hopefully help um, communities be um, both adapt to what may be coming down the path for them, um, but certainly when um, disaster strikes that they're more resilient in returning um, and and keeping people safe. So um, even on the resilient side of things, um, we um, you know we've we have made some progress even though we haven't done a climate bill um, up on Capitol Hill. So and you know I think those last two points the the 2018 bill and 2020 um, you know, underscore um, what Laurel was talking about uh, with bipartisanship. I mean, a lot of that work was really done in a bipartisan manner um, and allowed those um, to move forward. Um, but what we're looking at doing now um, as we pivot to the President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, um, you know, is really shaped by what Tina um, was talking about earlier and um, the stakeholder advocacy um, that really has been um, a great um, asset to have in the last few years. Um, you know, obviously um, the climate issues, um, we've been, people have been concerned about them. We've been grappling with them up on Capitol here, Hill here um, for many years, decades. Um, and um, as you probably all have learned, whether you have a short or longer congressional career, um, you know, it just you just have to have the right moment and you have to have a confluence of issues coming together in order to advance legislation legislation is hard or legislating is hard um and it's gotten harder um in you know i've seen it get harder in the in the course of my career up here and so um you know thankfully we've we've had a, a moment um where um added advocacy um, from both uh, traditional um, traditional voices and um, new voices, like um, young people in particular, um, but also voices um, that have um, improved, well, not improved is the wrong word, but have been able to elevate their concerns um, and, and there, I mean, I think especially the environmental justice um, groups who have often worked, you know, very locally, um, but have been able to, um, to build up strategic partnerships with each other um, and with some of the bigger environmental groups to really start, um, you know, having 
um, having input and and moving people up here on Capitol Hill. So um, all of that is is really great and has pushed climate um, to the forefront. And I think, you know, would be, um, um, you know, also, you know, it's unfortunate that we have a global pandemic, um, but it also is um, big disruptions um, from pandemics or other financial stressors often are the are the points in our society and in our history where we've been able to reevaluate and change things. And so um, obviously the COVID pandemic has um, and and has forced us to um, look at how our country operates um, in, with new eyes and, and new light and new um, energy to um, to change things. And I would say, you know, the the racial um, issues that the murder of George Floyd um, have brought forward, and unfortunately, so many others, um, you know, has all it's all really come together um, in a way that makes um, you know that we saw. President Biden tie those crises together and give us um, hopefully the opportunity to make progress and on all of those fronts in a in a united way. And that's you know really what we're we as congressional staffers are facing um, now is you know can we do that? Um, and uh, it's going to be exciting next couple of months. I think as I close out here. Um, Maybe the one thing to to say, um, and this may come up in um, in Dan's questions as well. Um, you know, there are big differences between um, today and where we were in two thousand and nine when we were able to pass um, Waxman Markey. Um, and you know, I think Katie McGinty. Um, might have mentioned it, um, you know, part of it is, you know, unfortunately, we're a dozen years deeper into the climate crisis and um, Mother Nature is making, you know, very apparent um, the serious risks and threats um, to people and their communities that, that come with that. Um, we're also a dozen years into more um, clean energy development and deployment, um, which I think makes um, makes people grasping uh, a zero emission future um, easier. Um, when I was working on the previous select committee in, in 2007 through 2010, I mean, one of the things we were really trying to do is tell those stories about clean energy and what it meant in um, for America and in communities in America. And, and, you know, it was just, we had to work harder to find those stories. And now um, it's really, um, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, and there are thankfully a lot of good news stories um, out there. Um, so those are, those are definitely big changes um, that are influencing things. Um, I mentioned a second ago, um, the outside advocacy piece. I think, you know, we have um, more public pressure and additional voices um, coming than we did in 2009. We definitely had, um, you know, uh, the public asking us to, to act to, on climate back then, um, but it's, it's definitely at an at a elevated level. Um, now, um, one of the key things in 2009 was um, was where the business community and especially the electric utilities were, um, and they actually really needed certainty on how um, climate um, was going to was going to affect their business climate policy. Um, they had, you know, 
coal plants um, that were aging and that needed new investment. And, and basically their investors saying, well, we don't really want to give you money until we know what the rules of the world on carbon policy are going to be. Um, and so, you know, they were motivated to have Congress put those rules um, in place. Um, and this was all just before, you know, the big natural gas boom. Um, and so, um, you know, some of those concerns have been alleviated in the last um, decade because they've just, you know, made a big switch to, to natural gas. Um, so I think, you know, the, the business community is definitely engaged because they see Democrats in control of the White House and the House and the Senate. And they know, um, you know, this policy uh, discussions are happening and they want to and they want to um, engage. But um, from my perspective, they don't have this. There isn't the same sort of urgent need um, from from them as we saw in um in 2009. Um, and then the difference in the margins um, in the House and the Senate. Um, so as I said earlier, I was a science person. Um, so not didn't take much um, history or political science really in my education. And so I really didn't understand how um, how uh, historic uh, the the period uh, of 2009 and 2010 was. Um, you know, we had Democratic margins in the House and the Senate, and having the White House like we hadn't had since you know basically 1965 when um, President Johnson was able to push through so many of uh, great society um, legislation that he did. Um, so uh, and you know. That's uh, it's it is not <laughs> it is not that way now um, with the margins that we have in the House and basically uh, no margin in the Senate. Um, but I think um, you know the the energy bill in uh, the end of last year um, should give everyone some hope that we can find um, some way forward. And we have you know, things in front of us like infrastructure that do have bipartisan support or can have bipartisan support. Um, and um, so, um, and we also have, uh, you know, a reconciliation process um, that we just used um, for the COVID response and uh, the American Rescue Plan um, that obviously is not, um, um, can't maybe deliver as comprehensive response to climate as we would like, um, but certainly can make some key investments that we know will bring big benefits, um, whether it's in um, clean energy tax um, or um, other investments um, that exist uh, for, for existing programs um, in energy over at the Department of Interior and ag on the natural side of things. So, um, you know, I think it offers um, a positive way forward if we ultimately um, have to use that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the president is is pivoting um, to his Build Back Better agenda. And um, we know that it's popular. And so, um, you know, I'm hopeful that our Republican colleagues um, will engage um, in a way that, you know, we can put a, a bipartisan infrastructure bill together that's good um, for, um, for people and communities um, and helps advance us on the, uh, towards climate action. Um, so I think I'll wrap up there with um, two reading recommendations and then Dan can ask me a question. Um, just uh, this week, I think it's hard to say um, what happens when these days, but um, there is an article on Rolling Stone by Patrick Reese, I think is how you say his last name, R-E-I-S, um, that I thought did is a short, good um, kind of retrospective analysis of Waxman Markey. 
Um, I find that in reading retrospectives of that time, it brings to mind the parable of the blind men and the elephant, and everybody feels a different piece of the elephant. Um, so that article felt sort of closest to what I've seen read of, of the part of the elephant that I, 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 um, I felt during that time. And then if you want to feel the underside of the elephant, um, read the chapters in Coke Land uh, by Chris Leonard, um, which was a book that came out in 2019. It's a pretty fascinating book all along, but you can go um, go to the chapters. Uh, there's a couple of chapters near the back on climate and energy that are worth reading. So, Thank you for the lots of book recommendations today um, during Climate Camp number three. Um, Thank you, Juana, uh, so much for sharing your recollections and um, great advice and guidance. Um, I honestly, I'll admit I'm, I'm thrown off a little bit. I had a series of really, really, really tough questions that I was just gonna hammer you with, but now that I know there's a kitten in the room, I can't possibly bring myself to do that. Um, I wouldn't want his, his fluffy ears to hear those tough questions. So you're off the hook, thanks to Boomi. Um, I know they were they're were, they were pretty good, but I do have some questions uh, before we wrap up. Um, the first is you you cited Tina's discussion earlier about stakeholder engagement. Um, you were part of the select committee staff last Congress that produced a pretty comprehensive report, um, and there was a pretty comprehensive stakeholder engagement process that led to that report. Um, and this this question there it is. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen it in print. Um, the this this question kind of comes from the audience as well and so i'm going to try to weave it in what i was going to ask but what are your reflections on how you uh and and your chairwoman and your colleagues navigated that stakeholder engagement process leading up to that report last july and what did you learn from that um the level of depth that you went into with stakeholder engagement that might inform where the select committee's work uh, leads in the future Thanks. Yeah, that I was definitely an oversight of me not to mention that. But so thank you for asking the question. Um, that was a huge part of what we did and a huge benefit to us. So um, we did actually in the fall of 2019 put out, you know, basically a big request for information and had a I think it was 13 question letter and we got over 700 substantive responses to that, um, which was great, but, uh, you know, also a lot, it was like a dozen of us um, to get through. Um, so, but, and, but our team used that as kind of a launching place um, for some additional conversations. And, um, you know, we had, we stopped counting at basically a thousand stakeholder meetings um, that we had across, you know, all of the staff. Um, but I think, you know, that was actually really part of how we were able to be um, successful um, just because we, one, we had so many great ideas coming in uh, and just set up additional um, dialogues um, with those stakeholders that, you know, continue to help us today and will try and do more on that. In fact, um, we probably will have some more stakeholder engagement coming soon. Um, and then on the inside, I mean, we had a members day, so we heard from members and then also engaged across a number of caucuses uh, in order to get get their input. Um, and that is, you know, that's one reason the book is, uh, the report is so big. Um, we tried to cover a you know, have a comprehensive response, um, but also, you know, put a lot in there um, that um, this Congress can build on and probably future Congresses. Thank you very much. Um, you sort of touched on this towards the end of your remarks. Um, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about your thoughts on how the legislative and the executive branches work together to produce mm -hmm. you know, big bills. Um, we focus, I mean, yes, I tends to focus a little bit more on Congress and today's topic is really, you know, aimed at a congressional audience, but are there things that you've seen in your experience working on all the energy bills that you've worked on over the years that um, um, you know, that just examples of maybe where that legislative executive branch interaction has been really fruitful 
um, as a maybe something to look forward uh, or look for in the future as the Biden administration navigates a closely divided Congress? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. I mean, ideally, um, an administration and Congress are you know working in a complementary fashion. Um, you know, Congress passes laws, and then um, the ex you know the onus is on the executive branch um, to cut to execute um, <laughs> on, in that in that regard. So. Um, I'm trying to think if there is a good example. I mean, it, it goes uh, it goes back and forth. Um, one, because um, obviously the sometimes um, the administration, you know, sets something up um, creative that then we want to um, end up legislating on and honing. One example there uh, on that front is would be Electrify Africa, um, which um, was some legislation that ended up passing in 2015, 2016, I think, um, but really sprung out of the Obama administration's um, work in Africa on a, in a program called Power Africa, um, you know, really understanding this important connection between development and energy. Um, and so then that um, ultimately led to some bipartisan legislation um, and that program continuing. Um, another place I potentially a precursor to the BRIC program that I that I mentioned earlier is also during the Obama administration kind of post Sandy, they had a sort of resilience competition and, um, you know, requested kind of um, um, proposals from across the country and, and got, you know, as many red states as blue states um, engaging, I think, which is another example in this space of where we have some bipartisan agreement. Um, and so I think, you know, learning from what happened there is a sort of pilot project from the administration um, really helped inform then the development of the BRIC program in 2018 and hopefully, you know, what we can do more here in 2020, 2021, sorry, we're in 2021. Know, 2021. Um, <laughs> we're, we're like almost a quarter through it already. It's crazy. Um, my last question for you is, and it's a little bit of a spin on the question that we've asked Katie and Tina and Laurel you know, one of the one of the things we're trying to communicate in today's session is that the past matters um, and that what happened in previous Congresses is, is relevant to today's climate debate. For for someone who's sort of seen as much as you have on Capitol Hill and worked on so many bills that have passed and bills that maybe fell short at the end, um, what is your advice to staff or current staff, um, folks that you're working with on either side of the aisle about sort of in which contexts does the past matter the most? And are there, is there sort of a limit to that? Is there, an, is there a limit to when, you know, maybe trying to sort of take lessons from, you know, past legislative efforts, maybe there isn't, mm -hmm. maybe the relevant stops, maybe we're, I, I wanna just ask whether or not we're, we're overselling this point um, for, a, for a contemporary congressional staff audience. No, I think it. I think it matters, um, and it continues to matter. I think it's hard to say. I mean, at some point, it does tend to fade away, but it's hard to say when that is. I mean, you know, I uh, there's certainly been critiques, valid critiques um, of cap and trade and changes in both California and in the Reggie states where they have it in place over the years. Um, but, you know, I think people still think it would be a helpful policy, um, but the politics just really don't line up on it right now, given um, the experience um, of not getting it across um, the, or across the President Obama's desk in, in 2010. Um, and, you know, I think part of that has um, allowed uh, other 
thing, the other important aspects of climate policy to come forward, I mean, one thing I think people forget about Waxman Markey is it wasn't just cap and trade. I mean, there was a renewable electricity standard in it. There was a bunch of stuff we did for buildings and for trying to move the move the needle on on transportation emissions. Um, so some of those things that we had in there are now um, kind of front and center of the policies that we're trying to trying to move. Um, you know, I think what really matters too is just um, kind of where you are. The other thing that has changed, as I said, is just our energy, our electricity system in particular has changed so much and there's a lot of changes in personal vehicles happening. Um, so we really are at a point where going forward on climate, you know, we need to reevaluate what, you know, what are really the best policies to help us reduce the emissions that we need to re reduce. And then, you know, sadly, we've been just pretty negligent on adaptation and resilience for all these years. Um, and so we really need to get going on that in a, in a comprehensive way. Um, so that, you know, <laughs> maybe there's nothing to learn from the past, except that um, we can't keep ignoring it like we have in the past um, is what I would say. But since you had Katie McGinty on, I mean, she, I don't even know if she raised it, but like she was in the administration when Clinton tried to do the BTU tax. So, um, you know, it's not just Rex and Markey. There's a, there was a whole other, you know, decade, decadal issue then too, which I think that one has largely faded um, as a specific thing. But obviously, America's view and Americans' views on tax um, taxes um, still influences our discussion on on carbon tax and, and going that way ultimately. So, but I see my clock says four, so I should probably wrap up there. Well, thank you so much um, for sticking oh, with us. Right I can't hear you, Dan. Oops, is that a little bit better? Hopefully, maybe it's just me. Okay. Um, I'll keep an eye out for the chat in there in our Zoom. I honestly didn't do anything wrong as far as I know. Um, we uh, will wrap it there. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll go in reverse order. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Katie, for joining us today. Um, we're at four o'clock. And so um, our panelists are excused. Um, we've, we've taken up a huge chunk of your afternoon and you've been super, super generous with your time and with your thoughts. Um, let me just say a couple quick things to close out. Um, the first, and maybe the most important thing, uh, is that if you missed any of the session today, um, we will have uh, an archive posted online, uh, along with written materials, presentation materials, um, and um, it'll be up shortly. And so if you missed anything, please visit us online at www.esi.org um, to check out everything um, from today's session. Um, you know, a couple quick, just very broad brushstroke takeaways that I think you'll see reflected in the notes. Um, one is that, um, you know, notwithstanding my last question to Anna, it does actually matter where we've been. Um, it does, um, does help us understand where we are presently. Um, and I think, you know, Katie said it, that going forward, we need to, and one of the benefits of knowing where we've been is that it allows us to blend the tried and true with innovation. And I think that's a really important point. Tina's presentation was all about civil society and civic engagement, uh, just absolutely critical. And I thought one point she made is that it's critical for those communities that are affected, but it's also critical to build sort of the political support for climate action. Um, and she had lots of wonderful things to say too about the, the role of younger people um, setting a new baseline for what's acceptable when it comes to climate solutions. Um, and, um, you know, it, while, you know, notwithstanding the importance of knowing about the past, it's it's clear, and um, I think I would agree with her 100% that the standard um, has shifted quite a lot over the last decade or two. Um, you know, I think um, the perceptions and misperceptions about what average voters want um, when it comes to compromise was a really interesting point I took away from Laurel's presentation. And um, obviously that's made so much more complicated these days by the role of primaries and primary opponents um, relative to the general election, which is for you know safe seats, um, seats that don't change hands very often or late, they don't change party very often. Um, compromise is hard work. Um, it's not accidental. Um, it's not automatic. Uh, 
Um, but very often, in fact, maybe most often, it's worth the effort putting it in. Um, and I think one thing that came out over the course of multiple presentations today was, um, while it wasn't covered much in the news, we just had a big energy bill pass um, at the end of 2020. Um, and that matters. Um, it's a data point. Um, not just did we get good policy with the HFCs, but um, we also have a recent example of where bipartisan energy policy can be enacted. Um, and um, Anna, I think you were the one who brought up the BRIC program a little bit earlier as a, as a previous example of when good things can happen around um, resilience. So some highlights, not by any stretch and a reason to, to settle or to think we don't have more to do, but um, it is important to, um, to, to point out where we've, where we've had some success. Um, let me begin to wrap up. Thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us today. Um, uh, again, to Anna, Laurel, Tina, and Katie, thanks so much. Let me also thank some of the members of Team ESI. I'll start with Anna again for co-moderating or moderating the session with Katie at the outset. I'd also like to thank Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todorov, and Omri Laporte, as well as our five fabulous interns, Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel for helping out behind the scenes today. Um, we're going to put a survey up. There it is. Uh, it's a link. Uh, we read every response. Um, if you have an opportunity to take two minutes to fill out our survey, it's really, really valuable to us. It helps us understand um, sort of where we're hitting and where we're missing. And so if you are able to do that, please do. We appreciate it very much. Um, we have a couple things coming up. Um, just uh, I'll do a couple ESI plugs. Um, we will be looking at the issue of nuclear decommissioning uh, and congressional oversight next week. If that interest, appeal, if that issue appeals to you, I hope you'll sign up online. Um, we also have one more regular uh, climate camp. I don't want to say regular climate camp. We have one more of the originally four, originally planned four-part series of climate camp. It's going to be at the end of April, and we're going to be looking at double whammies, things that we can do in the near term to deliver mitigation and adaptation benefits. It's coming together. It's going to be fabulous. Uh, I hope everyone will check it out. We are also planning, and this might be the first time I have a date to announce, a bonus climate camp. That's right, May 21st, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, Friday at two o'clock. We're going to convene a set of experts or a panel of experts to talk about budget reconciliation and what it means for the present debate. Come, came up a couple times today. We're going to use um, uh, a bonus episode of Climate Camp where we can dig deeper a little bit. And if you're interested, of course, in the regular budget, you can go back to climate camp number one and listen to um, Kari, Franz, and Karen talk all about budget stimulus and appropriations. Um, if, uh, if you missed anything, one last plug, www.esi.org. And while you're there, please sign up for our newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Thank you all for joining us today for climate camp number three. It is a gorgeous day here in DC, and it's going to be a pretty nice day uh, in Washington uh, over the weekend. So I wish everyone a happy weekend. Um, stay safe uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.